for sitting down with me today. You're welcome. John, you are a winner of the NAPB's Lifetime Achievement Award. Congratulations. Thank you. Before we talk about that, can you tell me a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and maybe a fun fact, something that people are often surprised to learn about you? Well, I um, grew up in eastern Wisconsin on a dairy farm and uh, attended the University of Wisconsin for my undergraduate degree and got my PhD at the University of Minnesota. Um, I was on the faculty at the University of Nebraska for a while and then had the chance to come back to the University of Wisconsin in 1995. Um, certainly loved agriculture all my life and growing up being fascinated by plants and animals related to agriculture. Um, in my spare time, I like the outdoors. I like fishing and outdoors activities. What's the biggest fish you've ever caught? Um, about a 45 inch uh, muskie, I think, was probably the biggest one I've caught. Corn breeding, that's definitely something we're going to talk about. But first, a little bird told me that when you were a kid, you used to judge dairy cattle. And that's kind of what led to your fascination with plant breeding. How did that happen? How did judging cattle lead to a career in, in plant breeding? Well, I pretty much grew up on a dairy farm. My, my grandparents had the dairy farm. My grandfather was very influential in my life. And so he'd take me to different meetings. And so uh, I think I was maybe nine years old uh, when we went to a twilight meeting. And uh, it's a meeting where you go to somebody's farm and they tell you about current practices and that type of thing. Um, but they had a judging contest, so I won the, the junior division and I think I won a bag of milk replacer. <laughs> but uh, really throughout my life there, like I said, my grandfather and, and my uncle after him um, were you know, involved in choosing the bulls for the dairy herd and breeding the dairy herd. And I think uh, that helped me to develop a career in genetics. Uh, before them, my great grandfather apparently raised canaries, and so he bred for different songs in canaries and canaries and different uh, colors of the canaries. And so it's been kind of a uh, inheritance of being interested in genetics. Um, so then, when I went to undergraduate school, I had to decide what I was going to do, and I ended up being a genetics major at the University of Wisconsin. And uh, through that process, I uh, one of my first jobs as an undergraduate was to work for a corn breeding company and doing an internship in the summer. And uh, through that, I met some people who had jobs on campus. And then I worked with Mike Kassler, who was a forage grass breeder at the University of Wisconsin. And he had a lot of influence uh, as well in um, helping me continue on the path of becoming a plant breeder. And, and uh, I uh, took some plant breeding classes as an undergraduate and, and ultimately chose that for my graduate degree. You now develop maize lines suited to the northern maturity zones of the United States. Why is this important to the seed industry specifically, and what do those lines bring to the table for them? So my research program overall, um, and, and it's uh, been in collaboration with some really good colleagues at the University of Wisconsin, um, has focused a lot on understanding the genetics of maize and understanding the genome of maize and uh, training students in plant breeding. And through that process, we've learned a lot about um, genetic variation and published uh, useful papers and so on, and trained a number of students who are in the industry. Um, and as we went along, we, we realized that some of the material we were working with had some um, potential, was yielding quite well and looked good, and there isn't as much attention in uh, over time for some of the northern zones. We're not in the, the central growing zone, although with climate change, maybe Wisconsin will be in a little while. Um, and, and there was a growing interest as industry, as the major industries consolidated, there was a number of um, small seed producers in our area and so on who were looking for alternative options for um, inbreds and hybrids and, and just trying to understand more about the genetics. And, and uh, so through that process, we've uh, been advancing some things for testing for commercialization and, and um, hopefully to be used by people. But, you know, I feel kind of, I feel like uh, you know our contribution to the industry has has been a range of things. Um, you know, in corn, you don't really compete with the big companies. You can provide germplasm and so on, um, and you can provide options for smaller growers. But I think the impact the students have had in the industry has been substantial, and that's one way our work has gotten out there. And and some of the things we've understood about maize genetics and breeding overall has been impactful for the industry. Uh, in addition to some of the germplasm and inbreds that we've developed. 
I'm going to take a deep breath here. <laughs> you and your team at the Wisconsin Crop Innovation Center develop transformation and editing approaches for many crops, including new genotype independent approaches for crop species that at one time were difficult to work with. What have some of your major accomplishments been in that area? So in 2017, um, Monsanto graciously donated to the University of Wisconsin their um, transformation facility in Middleton, Wisconsin. Um, it was a facility where a uh, number of their um, primary events, Roundup Ready soybean came from and Bullguard cotton. And uh, they were consolidating things back to St. Louis. And so we we're very grateful to accept the gift. It was a time when um, in the US especially and, and worldwide, there was a discussion of the need for more capabilities for transformation and gene editing. And it seemed like a, um, at least a regional, if not a national opportunity to have a, a substantial capacity that was uh, available for public research and also for um, small companies as well. Um, and when we took that on, one of our goals was to try and be able to do transformation in, in more elite um, inbred lines or germplasm lines. Many of the cases, many species, there's only one or two cultivars that could be transformed and they're usually lab strains that didn't perform very well. And I've had a long-term interest in trying to um, facilitate and, and with my own research as well, get discoveries from the lab to um, a case or to, to commercialization perhaps, or to where companies can at least consider it for commercialization. One of the bottlenecks there was to be able to transform more elite material. Um, and so uh, we, at the center, we licensed um, technologies from a number of companies, including now Bayer and, and Corteva and, and Japan Tobacco, and applied those to some cultivars, some uh, better, more elite cultivars that hadn't been available in the public before to be transformed. Um, we transformed uh, some elite cultivars of soybean. We do work on sorghum. Um, Bayer was also gracious in, in releasing a line called LH244, an inbred line of maize that was quite elite that is amenable to transformation. And so we've been implementing that system. Um, and we've also worked on a number of other um, species that really hadn't had a lot of attention before for transformation or where transformation was difficult. Um, we have a project on pulses. So we are doing some things with common, pea, uh, common bean, uh, chickpea. Um, we're doing some work with cow pea. And so a number of the approaches that we're implementing and using, and you know, some things are, are Discoveries we've added it to processes and uh, other components or things that we've licensed or implemented from others, but they not only um, work relatively well across different cultivars within a species, but also um, in related sorts of species. And so we've uh, been able to um, have success in transforming a number of dicots, for instance. Uh, as I said, that didn't have as, as much attention, but as we look forward to the future, I think some of these pulse crops are gonna become more and more important. And, Hopefully we can help uh, lead that future as well. When you recently worked with another team from a different institution on really a breakthrough project involving the aging of cereal crops, can you explain a little bit about that to me and why it was so significant? Well, senescence is an important part of the plant life cycle. Um, when the plants are done growing, when they're, the annual plants are done producing grain, then they'll senesce and that helps with the dry down of the grain and um, remobilization of nutrients within the plants. And uh, so people have bred for stay green traits uh, to, to maximize the, the period of grain fill, you need the plants to maintain their photosynthetic capacity. And that's usually visualized by having a green leaf, but sometimes you have a green leaf and they aren't photosynthesizing. So there's uh, certainly some complexities to that. One thing over time that, that I and others had noticed um, is when you're pollinating corn, if you have ears that aren't, have, uh, have plants that have ears that don't form grain, um, they'll turn brown more quickly, they'll senesce more quickly in certain inbred lines than other ones in the row that are pollinated. So you could go and look at a row of, of a particular inbred line, see green ones and brown ones, and the brown ones would never have any seed. And so that was an initial thing that I'd been interested over time. And, and uh, Rajan Sikon was a postdoc in our group um, and, and uh, kind of took up an interest in that project. I think our first paper related to this, uh, what we now call sugar-induced silencing or the, where you uh, have feedback in the plant, the plant is photosynthesizing, but because there's no grain forming, then you have a 
backlog of sugar and that tells the plant it's time to be done in certain genetic backgrounds. Uh, I think in 2012, we published one of our first papers, Rajan was the lead author on that and uh, was able to characterize some of the genes that were expressed differently when you have this type of, of accelerated aging. Um, and uh, so Rajan continued some of the studies working on natural diversity and got a position at Clemson and recently was able to complete some of the analysis of that and get down to uh, um, a gene or several genes that seem to be important in the process, at least to step forward in understanding the senescence process. So it's always very fulfilling to see people go from your group and continue on to productive careers. And my uh, major advisor uh, for my degree, Dr. Ron Phillips, always said the best thing you can do is give your students and postdocs your best ideas. And so I always try to do that with all of the people and I have a lot of them and sometimes the ideas aren't that good, but <laughs> I pass them on anyway. Um, so this was, this was exciting. There's still a lot of work to, to you know, turn this discovery into um, products and you know, there's, there's other groups that have worked on senescence, but clearly if you can maximize the grain filling period, both in corn and um, you know, for, if you could extend it in wheat, for example, or other species, um, that's ultimately going to help with the productivity and yield and maximizing capturing all of the photosynthate that's possible within the season. So we hope uh, this can be a step forward in advancing and making our crops more productive. Polyamal careers, as I said at the beginning, you're a recipient of the NAPB Lifetime Achievement Award. I'm not going to ask you how it feels to win an award like that. I'm sure it feels great. But rather, how does winning this award and being involved with the NAPB help you in your career advancing these crops and, and basically making the world a better place? Well, there's a number of amazing plant breeders in the U.S. and the world, and, and uh, they produce a lot of um, varieties, a lot of things that add the variety to our life, you know, different types of fruits and vegetables and so on. And, um, so yeah, our, our team has a small part in, in the overall process. And certainly it's, uh, it's an honor to have such an award, um, but, but there's many other accomplished people as well. And I'm always amazed um, by the success of, of plant breeders in general and how it's, it's supported work in the world. The, the thing about the National Association of Plant Breeders Organization, which I think is really important, is that you know there's, um, a Crop Science Society of America, a Horticulture Society of America, a Forestry Society. Um, but people, plant breeders work across all of these species and sometimes species of different types. Um, for instance, in our crop innovation centers, we work on you know, crop and vegetable species and, and that type of thing. And so by having an organization like the National Association of Plant Breeders, you could um, have all of these people come together who have a practical interests and practical goals of developing varieties, um, but you weren't necessarily tied to specific systems, agricultural systems or horticultural systems. And I think that's gonna be absolutely critical as we look to the future with the different types of things. Uh, there's a number of discussions about the um, need for diversification of, of different food types um, within our food systems. Um, different options for growers, um, needs for more fruits and vegetables in our diet, um, ways to remake the diet, uh, introducing some of the uh, species that hadn't been worked on for a while, so alternative types of grains and uh, legumes, for instance. And so I think you know that's one of the things with this National Association of Plant Breeders, it really provides a forum where people can get together who have a broad range of interest and share techniques, share ideas, and uh, like I said, we need, the, our, our, our world is in an urgent situation. We have the population growing, we have issues with climate instability for sure. Um, and, and so I think this organization is one of the key ones to helping address that urgency and help to uh, develop the varieties for the, for the future of the world. Yeah. Where's your next fishing trip plan? I'm, I'm hoping to head to Northern Wisconsin right after this meeting and catch a fish. It'll be the first time this summer. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. Thanks for sitting down with me. All right. Thank you.